Yeah, well, I guess it comes back to the old uh, was it Mike Mike Tyson quote: "Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face." And I think um, the the thing is, with every asset class, you get summer seasons, which we've had, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne real estate, for about five or six years, um, and then you get a winter season, and they there is, there's nothing. Uh, that's going to change there. And it's the same with governments. You know, people talking about the Labour government. Well, yeah, that, that's what follows a coalition government. That's not going to change. Uh, the, a lot of these things, um, they will continue to come and go. So the thing that needs to change is you. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You will hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately, to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now, let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Today I want to start with another timeless Warren Buffett quote. The only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Now just park that thought as you listen to today's episode because you'll become clear what that means. Now in recent times, not a day goes by without the mainstream media running another scaremongering article about how the sky is going to fall in and the property or share market is going to crash. If I earned a dollar for every time I heard or read the word bubble, crash, fall or recession, I'd be very wealthy. Unfortunately, fear sells and fear captures our attention and engages our emotion. And this negative media approach is not likely to change any time soon. In fact, it's likely to get worse as this dying industry have to try harder and become more desperate to create conflict and controversy as a means to survive. So if you're thinking about investing or you're an existing investor that's looking to secure good assets to improve and maintain your lifestyle and then secure your future long term, what can you do to avoid reacting and knee-jerking to this constant deluge of negative noise? Well, often the trap is not knowing how to be patient and letting it happen. It's a bit like buying a sailing boat with a fully experienced crew so you can go on an around-the-world holiday from Sydney to London and then trying to take over the controls from the captain when you get scared about the weather instead of just reading a book on the deck while the crew take care of the journey. Sitting back and relaxing can be harder than you might at first think. Unfortunately, trying to take control is exactly what most investors do and then they wonder why the results don't happen. Well, as I demonstrated in my book, The Freedom Formula, both property and shares in Australia have proved to be the most consistent growth investment classes, delivering an average of between 7 to 11% growth per annum over the last 90 years. So if this is the case, why does a considerable body of evidence suggest that the average investor fails to achieve the results and falls well short of their wealth accumulation goals? Clearly, the results are based not just on how the investment classes behave, but rather on how we as investors behave. Now, most of this comes down to investors leaving it too late to invest and or only investing for short periods. Given continuously fluctuating price cycles in shares and property, short periods of under 10 years rarely provide any return at all. But history also shows that the longer you, your investment horizon, say 15 years or more, the greater your chance of capturing good growth. However, many investors often fail to even achieve the average market returns. And why? 
Well, the excellent investment book, How Much is Enough, demonstrated that over 20 years, the market produced an average annual return of over 11%, but the average investor only earned about 4.48%. In other words, they missed out on 62% of the achieved return. So why don't many investors go the distance? Share and property market history is littered with the shipwrecked flotsam of investors who follow the media-driven herd and buy after the market has risen and then sell when the market falls. But why do investors seem to ignore the lessons from the past and just keep making these same mistakes? Well, it all comes down to the way we think and the way our brains are wired. Now, most investors ignore the boring, uneventful monotony of a long trip at sea. In other words, of investing in quality diversified portfolios and adopting a long-term hold approach. But instead, they allow themselves to be distracted and activated by the emotion of every shiny thing on the most recent media-driven hysteria. Emotional herd responses and the resulting market movements have all also been exacerbated by technology that has enabled everyone exponential access to constant streams of instant information. This has led to increased volatility from a greater focus on short-term results, which is then amplified by infectious mass media scaremongering. Once again, this is why you need to ignore the short-term external noise from factors that you can't control and adopt the time-honoured, patient and disciplined approach of investing in quality assets and then holding them for the long term. You then focus on the only thing that you can control – and the aspect that will have the biggest impact on your investment success, and that's how you think and how you behave. Now, how to do this is particularly important when we're facing the current headwinds and uncertainties that are posed by a whole raft of different things coming at us. We've got the flow on from the Royal Commission on Banking to the costs of and access to finance. We've got the upcoming federal election and the significant threats posed by the Labor government's proposed changes to negative gearing and capital gains tax on property, as well as franking credit reductions on shares. So how are you going to control yourself from either not starting or continuing to invest or knee-jerk reacting on current investments during these really uncertain times? Well, there's no better person than today's guest, Pete Wargent, to show you how he has weathered the storm and continued to grow through all of the seasons across multiple assets, across multiple global locations, across multiple decades. Pete started his professional career as a qualified chartered accountant in London and was previously a director of one of the big four accounting firms at Deloitte's. Now, together with his wife, Heather, Pete bucked the trend of his self-professed socialist upbringing and has been a successful long-term shares and real estate investor with a portfolio today that includes properties in London, Cambridge, the home counties and elsewhere in the UK. Over the long term, he's also built a very substantial Australian property portfolio, today owning properties in Sydney's eastern suburbs, the inner west and at Darling Harbour, as well as investment properties in Melbourne and Brisbane. Now, clearly, Pete walks the talk when it comes to investing and he gratefully parked his career in accountancy after having achieved financial independence from his investing at the tender age of just 33, which he detailed in his best-selling first book, Get a Financial Grip, A Simple Plan for Financial Freedom. He's now a five-times published finance author, and all of his books are must-reads for any investor. Now, in 2011, Pete also came out of early retirement to co-found Alan Wargent Property Buyers, an active agency in Australian and UK property markets, and he's got offices in Sydney, Brisbane and London, where he helps investors, home buyers and real estate funds to achieve their goals. On top of this, Pete's also the founder and director of Wargent Advisory, an Australian consultancy firm advising hedge funds and institutional investors. He specialises in the analysis, dynamics and impacts of Australian household debt, construction trends and real estate market cycles. Maintaining a comprehensive database of financial data, analysis and other information, his goal is really simple, to find an edge for you and his clients. Now, Pete is uniquely positioned to comment on housing markets combined with his unparalleled ability to deliver powerful, data-driven market analysis. So, as an active investor, a property buyer's agent, a strategist and a mentor, 
Pete uses his tried and tested strategies to assist investors in achieving their financial goals through profitable equities and real estate investment. Quite rightly, as you can see from all of that, Pete is recognised as one of Australia's brightest financial minds and he's regularly featured in all of Australia's mainstream media outlets. And he effortlessly achieves all of this while enjoying a really relaxed lifestyle and delivers his easy-to-understand message in a very down-to-earth and easy-going way. So make sure you do yourself a favour and subscribe to his free daily dose of insights in his blog by registering at petewargent.blogspot.com. And now, take the time to really listen and then re-listen to one of the few people that I genuinely respect, Pete Wargent. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Now, anyone who knows me well really understands that there's very few people that I genuinely respect. In fact, you can probably count them on an amputated hand. But today's guest is one of them. And why? Well, in many respects, he's a man after my own heart. He's got an ability to step back from the the noise of what's happening around the place. And he sees things for how they really are, not how people think they're going to be. And this is all based on facts, not on gut feel or self-interest. He calls it how he is. He takes an overall integrated view of things long term. And he walks his talk. So I'm really humbled to be chatting today with Pete Wargent. Welcome aboard to Get Invested, Pete. Pleasure, mate. I always get nervous when I get these amazing uh, introductions. So hopefully I uh, live up to the, the billing. Mate, uh, you just need to be you, mate, and uh, the rest will take care of itself, mate. I have no doubt about that. So no <laughs> pressure. No pressure. Pete, now you're extremely well known uh, around Australia and, and uh, probably the UK and other areas, but for those listeners who don't know who you are, can you sort of give us a, a quick rundown on what you're doing, where you're heading? Yeah, I suppose um, there, there are really three things that I do or three main uh, strands to my business. So um, I have a, a property buyer's agency, uh, which we started up in, in London uh, many, many years ago, but uh, these days mainly focused on uh, Brisbane and Sydney. Um, the second thing I do is something a bit different. I write um, reports that I consult for fund managers and hedge funds looking for market insights. And the third thing that I do um, is a 12-month uh, coaching program for uh, people who want to get um, big results. Yeah, fantastic, mate. Now, I'm I, sort of keen to get you to take us on your journey because I know it's been a really interesting one and then quite a different one in that uh, you tend to take a, a much more diverse uh, view of the world than a lot of uh, punters that I catch up with. So can I get you to take us back to as early as you like uh, and give us a bit of a feel for you know your upbringing and, and what that meant to your journey both professionally but also in uh, when and what you decided to start investing in? Yeah, well, if you want to go all the way back to the beginning, as you can hear... Um, an Englishman by birth. Um, my uh, my dad was a uh, social worker. And my mum was a, a very uh, very left wing uh, socialist um, agitator back in the day. So it's slightly unconventional upbringing. I, I was actually um, brought up. My, my dad's work used to take him round to the, um, the the rougher parts of, of England, and uh, so I, I was born and brought up in Sheffield in a. Um, in a young offenders hospital uh, or hostel, uh, so I guess what you might call a halfway house where people are uh, released from from prison. And my dad, my dad was a warden, so uh, yeah, it was a pretty uh, how should we say, pretty lively sort of place to be to be brought up. Yeah, um, yeah my dad, uh, my parents, very different political views back in those days. It was very um, uh, the 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 UK was a very divided place back then. You, you essentially had. The, the Conservative Party, which was for business, and then you had the Labour Party, which was for the for the unions and the workers. And my, my parents were trades unionists. Um, so yeah, look, the times have changed obviously over that time, and I, I, uh, I guess um, come away with slightly different political views than they had. But I, I had yeah. massive massive respect for what um, what they stood for. Mate. Of course, uh, South Yorkshire in those days, we had the. Um, the closure of the coal mines, the closure of the steel industry. Uh, it was a very highly emotional time. And 
yeah, it, it was uh, that there was no standing, no middle ground back then. You stood on one side of the fence or the other. Yeah, mate, I want to drill straight in there if I can uh, on two two things that you've mentioned. Uh, firstly, you've moved around quite a bit, as I understand, and secondly, uh, you know the fact that your folks were uh, probably the antithesis of uh, your outlook on. Uh, what you're doing, uh, which would have made, been interesting uh, given what they saw in you and what you were doing was probably going against the grain. Can you talk me through, one, the mobility side of things and how that's impacted, but also uh, why your views different, differed and also how you manoeuvred through that given that it was probably not something that was supported a lot at home in the early days? Yeah, for sure. I think the moving around thing, it was a bit of a double-edged sword. I think at junior school, it, it didn't impact me too too much. I think you, you tend to slot in those kind of ages. But certainly um, when I got to high school, I found, I found it personally very difficult. I went to um, <clears throat> went to a pretty rough comprehensive school on the edge of a council estate, but I also, uh, you know, where, where to be to be blunt, uh, it was pretty easy to be top of the class and but then uh, subsequently uh, moved to another part of the country where I went to a, a selective school and then realized there was actually quite a lot of um, smart people around so <laughs> and also in Britain you know people different parts of the country have very different accents um, so you don't you don't feel it you stand out and it's um, teenage years are hard enough without being the person that sounds different and yeah. comes from a different background so I, I found it very it was challenging um, I think if you're looking for positives, um, I think uh, certainly anyone with an entrepreneurial outlook would be familiar with um, the ability to work with different types of people uh, is, a, is probably one of the, the most important skills as an entrepreneur uh, because you meet people right from the very top in the C-suite um, you know, to people all the way down who are starting their journey. Uh, so I think in that regard, it's to be in good stead, um, but yeah. certainly, certainly challenging. Uh, but as you said, for, for my parents, um, they were very keen, um, very keen that we went to study at higher education. That was something that my parents were very keen on, and we we did that. So I went to the university in Sheffield. But um, yeah, certainly from from a, an investing point of view, um, yeah, that was very much against the grain because our, our parents' generation, um, it was really a case in Britain of people bought their council houses if if they could from the government, but yeah. nobody. You know, very very few people invested in the stock market. There was there was one uh, one or two um, floats of uh, of companies uh, like the British Telecoms and the like. But most people, the stock market was just not not something they did, and it was all about um, the the pension, uh, particularly for public sector workers like my mum and dad. Um, so for people to go out and invest in real estate, become a landlord, I mean that was almost a uh, a swear word. So, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely challenging to go against that grain. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I'm interested in where your interest in, in that came from, given that you would have been swimming in, in that philosophy you've just talked us through. And then uh, when you did say, hey, I think I'm going to go down this route, how you then uh, negotiated that uh, effectively or communicated that with your folks, if at all, uh, when you were starting the journey, mate, I'm just uh, quite interested in that. Yeah, it was difficult. Um, I suppose in terms of how I came to it. So um, <clears throat> when I um, when I left school, I, I wasn't. I was a bit of a, a lost soul for a while, and I, I did um, did some factory work for a long time. Nothing too exciting, and I ended up coming to Australia essentially to play cricket. That was my first passion, okay. and um, went to play at uh, the Waverley club as it was then known in uh, in Bondi um, and uh, I think it, being away from home at a young age uh, I think a lot of palms find with that distance it's, it's challenging first time you're away from friends and family uh, and it, it was a bit of a transition period but it was it was only really towards the end of that year where I realized um, you know we had a surfing holiday up the Queensland coast and it was only just as that trip was drawing to a close that I realized uh, Oh gee, I've got to go back to the you know the freezing England winter, and I I, I guess um, one of the things I always wanted to do was travel and live overseas, and that just um, cemented it for me, and and that actually in the end that drove my career choice. So um, 
I, um, I, I, when I had my university degree, I, I looked on the uh, the skills shortage list that Australia had back then and still does. And top top of the list uh, for skill shortages: uh, chartered accountants, um, hairdressers, and uh, nurses. Um, now I didn't I didn't really. Uh, if you've ever seen my profile pictures, you're not, <laughs> hairdressing wasn't going to. Uh, no, you'd go broke on your hair, do mate. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, it was a, a career in numbers was the, the standout. So, uh, and it, it, I mean, chartered accounting exams are tough. You know, they're, they're, they're something you really have to work for. And um, so I did three years in London um, and got my CA qualification, but that was 60 points on the skill shortage list. And uh, yeah. having done three years in my um, career, uh, that gave me extra points. Um, being able to speak English used to... Uh, Baggy five points back then. I just about uh, scraped through on that one, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So with, with all of the points, um, and the fact that I was under thirty was was also a bonus. Uh, I just about got over the line with one hundred and twenty points, and yeah. that's how I came to um, to uh, fi- finally emigrate to Australia on a permanent basis. So the uh, let's drill into the accounting bit for a minute. Were, were numbers something that came uh, naturally to you? Were you, were you good at maths at school? Or was it just purely, how am I going to get back to Australia, the, the quickest route, uh, let's make that happen? T- t- tell me about your uh, your thinking at that time, mate. Yeah, it was really driven by the, the points test. Uh, but that said, I, I absolutely loved maths when I was at junior school. I I, I focused on it to the the exclusion of almost everything else. I, I just um, just wanted to push ahead and, and get as far as I could down that track. But strangely... Um, it was actually when I changed schools to a grammar school um, when I was probably, I guess, about 14. I moved from, from Yorkshire down to toward somewhere closer to, to London and um, <clears throat> a town called uh, Chelmsford, which is a bit of a nondescript sort of place. But uh, the, the people down there have been studying a whole different curriculum. And I went from being top of the class to somebody who essentially didn't know what I was doing. So, <laughs> And it's, it's funny how that can knock your confidence when you're young. So yeah. looking back now, I can rationalise it, you know, because they were studying trigonometry when I was still doing, uh, you know, hundreds, tens of units. And uh, it wasn't because I was it wasn't because I was dumb. It was just a, a whole uh, a whole course outline that I'd never studied. So um, yeah, so I didn't pursue maths up until um, at university level. In fact, I was studying um, economic and in industrial and economic history because that, that was something I found I was pretty good at. But um, yeah, so it was, it was mainly it was mainly driven by um, as I thought I, I saw it as a secure career. Didn't necessarily think I'd be passionate about it, but um, I, I saw it could get me where I wanted to go. And a lot of chartered accountants go on uh, into executive roles too, um, yeah. and in fact, it was the it was the chartered accountancy um, that really uh, led me into investing because a lot of what I did as a CA was preparing listed company financials and, and auditing them when I was in practice. Um, so that that gave me a skill set that I, I could understand the fundamentals of a business, and that's what drew me to the stock market. But um, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't say um, I actually recently caught up with an old teacher and he said yeah, you're quite clearly one of those people who um, should always have ended up working for yourself because all the way through school, all the way through my career at Deloitte where I went, um, went all the way up to director, but I, I always did the bare minimum. I never did um, <laughs> never did anything to excel, uh, but it was only when I came to work for myself and found something that I, I really had a passion for that I put in that extra 20% of effort. Yeah, well, and I guess that that sort of uh, I'm I'm reading between the lines here, mate. But uh, and I'm I'm saying this because I'm very similar. I was a bit of a gypsy when we were a kid and bounced around Australia from school to school, and uh, found myself in the same situation where uh, thrown into stuff that was I just hadn't even touched on. And I the way I cope was just to work a lot harder than uh, the rest of the the crew to catch up was that something that became part of your sort of way of approaching things as a result of that mate or not oh look a, l- a little bit for the first year i figured if you, if you keep your head down and work hard but uh, um i guess I, I quite quickly realized that um you know i was a pretty intelligent um student um and you know what particularly i noticed with when i started um, new modules that nobody else had done um, i was quite quickly able to get back into the top quartile it was just uh, 
yeah, it's when when I did the entry exams and they were testing me on things that I'd never never seen before. Uh, yeah, it's funny how that that can knock your confidence, but that I mean that still applies even as an adult. You know, if yeah. you, it's the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's spot on. But looping back to your folks, then, so you you sort of. Uh, uh, came over here to play some cricket and I'm, I'm guessing rubbing shoulders with some of the uh, cricket fraternity uh, may have started to influence your outlook a bit as well. Uh, you have then jumped into the accounting exercise as a way of uh, getting a ticket back here and that sort of uh, clearly started shaping your thinking a little bit. Uh, conversations with your folks, I, I guess you weren't spending a lot of time with your folks at that time but I, I can imagine uh, the talk at the Christmas table uh, uh, may have been pretty interesting. Can you talk us through uh, what that looked like and what, if anything, came out of that uh, that may have changed the the way you went or how you tackled it? Yeah, it's actually it's interesting you say that because it, it was literally back in back in the day. There was no FaceTime, there was no uh, no Skype, anything like that. And um, we did used to send letters or um, yeah, so or the other thing that people used to do. You know, you'd go to the pub and then phone home at, at midnight and it would be, you know, it'd be $5 a minute or whatever the phone call was and you'd, you'd, uh, you'd shout a few things down the phone. But, yeah, the, the contact was very different back then. It was, um, uh, <clears throat> yes, more sporadic and less less instant. So, um, yeah, that, that was uh, difficult. I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, my parents actually, when I was a teenager, they separated. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't a great time at home, so yeah. certainly I'm from a large family of boys, um, seven of us, and uh, yeah, we certainly did. My younger brother, who is very similar age to me, we um, we sort of uh, just in hindsight, we just moved out. You know, we st- steered clear of home uh, yeah. for a few years, <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah, we I guess uh, like a lot of young Brits, we we spent most of our time in the pub and popped home occasionally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's probably happened uh, in isolation, you folks. You're re- living another life, pretty much, uh, in that regard, and probably influenced more of a, a, by those that you were socialising with and, and working with that started to to formulate your views on. Well, this is where I'm heading, and and this is where I'm going to start investing. Let's let's start talk a bit more about the the commencement of your investment journey. Then, so you jump on board with Deloitte's. Uh, you're doing your thing over there initially in UK and then that gets you back here to Australia. Uh, what was the trigger that that started the investment journey and what did you invest in initially, mate? Yeah, well, I think, um, yeah, but my, my thinking, and I, I, I know you've interviewed uh, Chris Gray, who I think he even did a stint at Deloitte. We've all done the, uh, yeah. the tour of duty, but I guess <laughs> like a lot of uh, people, I some people just they take that type of work and others don't and for me it was a means to an end and I just thought well if I if I don't want to be doing this for for 40 years then I need to find another way so that's that's what drew me to investing there was no uh, no other uh, particular driver just to to, to um, chase financial independence and more freedom but uh, yeah my, my initial investments were all stock market Basically, yeah. it's interesting because today a lot of people know me as a real estate uh, commentator and enthusiast. But yeah, it was very much uh, uh, sticking to what I knew: um, company financials, company analysis. Um, I, I think over time I realised that even with all of the knowledge in the world, though, uh, that in analysing companies and even companies that you have an immediate familiarity with, um, things can change, and you can still make mistakes. Um, you know, even all the way up to the Buffets of the world that, you know, they had investments that didn't work out as planned. Um, so that over time, and I had, um, like like all young people in the stock market, I had some big wins that I gave back, um, just like uh, people do at the casino and all the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in time, that drew me towards more of a, a passive style of investing. But it, originally, I was very keen on the analysis, picking individual stocks, um, and it was only, in fact, when I met my now wife that uh, the real estate came onto the radar. Okay. Um, it was um, she. She was a, a homeowner from a very young age in uh, she bought a house in Cambridge in the UK, uh, which she still has today. Is you know best part of a quarter of a century later. But um, yeah, it was really I just had to respect the results. So it wasn't. Um, I've always been agnostic. I don't care whether the returns come from yeah. 
you know, real estate, stock market, whatever. So, um, but um, yeah, I just had to respect the, the results from from the leverage and the growth that she'd achieved. She's a couple of years on me, but uh, she won't thank me for mentioning. But um, yeah, and, and that's what <laughs> that, that's what really uh, got me to realise that there was an opportunity, um, you know, to do something using some leverage as well. Yeah, and I guess I'd, I'd have this conversation with people all the time because I'm, I'm also like yourself invest in equities as well as property but in the early days it was all about growing the nest egg for me as quickly as I could and the the ability to leverage using the bank's money to significantly increase my asset base even if the growth wasn't even quite as good as shares I knew that over time I'd come out in front is that pretty much the thinking that started to gel in your head and then sort of you yourself and your wife then pursued that um Ongoing. So talk us through the journey from oh, that. Look, a hundred percent. I think I went through that exact thought process. It's like, right, okay. If there's two of us, we were both um, at, at Deloitte. We were both directors, and then we both did um, a stint in industry. And I, I just figured, look, if if we've got two full time salaries here with bonuses, well, let's make the absolute most of that um, while we while we're still uh, viewed favourably. Um, in, in the eyes of the banks, and um, yeah, we maximised our leverage uh, back in those days before before later transitioning to um, to doing our own thing. So, um, and the way I looked at, it, particularly in Australia, is that you've got a, a stock market that's almost ready made for people wanting to generate income in their later years because you've got high dividends, you've got yeah. franking credits, yeah. and. Uh, before Labor gets their hands on, then we've even got uh, some franking credit refunds. But you know, it's, it's a tailor-made stock market for income. Great but cash flow. Was, yeah, we're, we're, but I figured, well, in the earlier years when I've got um, potentially you know half a century of time on my side, well, why not use that leverage? And that, that's what we did. So we yeah. we went pretty hard into uh, Sydney property, and it, I was interested to hear Chris um, the, the other day on your podcast saying that um, his biggest returns came from when everybody said don't buy and it's, it's been exactly the same journey for us. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. been uh, not, not just in property, it's the same in the stock market. Um, yeah. It's when, when sentiment is at its lowest. Uh, so we bought a lot of properties in Sydney, uh, in Bondi, Darling Harbour, Inner West, um, all around um, 2007, 8, 9 when the, the market numbers might have not been showing a massive correction, but the, the difference in sentiment was like chalk and cheese. You could you could make low ball offers on blue chip property, and it was, um, it was don't get me wrong, it was a difficult thing to do when everybody's telling you not to. Um, but I've tried to carry that principle right through to today. So um, you know, in in Australian property, which I know a lot of your listeners follow, um, whenever I hear people say. You know, it's, it's doom and gloom for this particular market. I put it on the watch list um, because that's when the bargains come. So we bought, we're, we're mainly capital city focused, but we bought in Geelong West in 2014 when everybody said it was uh, uh, last one out, uh, switch off the lights. And uh, the um, yeah Brisbane Apartments just came onto the radar last year after four or five years of falling prices. So we, we picked one up in in new farm with views um and we even bought some land in uh, some farmland in the uk because of the you know the brexit fallout you can buy stuff on the cheap it's um no so, so that's really been our, our principle ever since is when, when sentiment's at its lowest that's when you make your money yeah it's but the old uh, uh, the old buffetism of you know get greedy when the uh market is fearful a bit like yourself i've always been a contrarian and we're coming into a a great zone now with with so much fear and uncertainty being perpetrated by the mainstream media there's going to be some great opportunities if if you can actually get the money (laughs) from the bank uh, then there's some uh, very good opportunities uh, yeah and in fact uh, the same applies exactly the same a principle applies in the stock market and it's, it's actually proven yeah. uh, that if you if you do the simple uh, it's known as the the dogs of the world strategy if you um if you buy the the um, etfs in the countries that have been the worst performers over the last couple of years um when everybody's saying it's the end of the world um then you will outperform the market easily over the coming years but it's obviously a very hard thing to do and um, I suppose Ireland was a classic case. 
in the, after the financial crisis. But if the most recent example I can give you would be um, Turkey with the currency crisis. Of course, of course, all fund managers had to pull out because they couldn't couldn't easily say to their clients, "Oh, we've got your money invested in Turkey." Um, but um, since the currency crisis was headline news, well, the ETF's gone from eighteen dollars to twenty eight um, in what six months or whatever it is. It's um, and the same applies across sectors um, as well as it does countries. Um, so, you know, when you know tech stocks have had an amazing run, so I wouldn't be rushing in to buy those. But you know, the least favoured sectors over the previous couple of years nearly always outperform over the coming years. But it's um, it's very hard to be the person that goes against the grain. But if you can learn that skill, it's very beneficial. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, the uh, influence of the herd is pretty strong, unfortunately, and the media. Who, who are in a, an industry that's under attack from online uh, pedal fear to try and sell newspapers. It's a, it's a uh, pretty interesting environment to, to swim against the, the flow, but you're right, the smart ones continue to do that, mate. Yeah, awesome. So uh, you're going hard at uh, Deloitte. Uh, you know, you're, you're famed for uh, being in a position where you are uh, hit financial freedom at 33. Uh, that gives you the opportunity then to jump ship and do your own thing. Can you talk us through uh, what led up to that and where to from there? Yeah, I think uh, one of the main drivers for us is that we wanted to travel. And I I always said if, if we're going to emigrate to Australia, I actually want to see the country. I'd hate to uh, to be one of those people that just stays in the city and never sees the place. So um, and we're all guilty of it, our own backyard, just the same in Britain. You know, A lot of people don't leave the their local area because they think, well, you know, it's all taken for granted. Um, you've got Europe on your doorstep and people don't see it. So, um, yeah, so we that was the main driver, really. We wanted to take, um, take a, some time out to see the country properly. And in the end, we took 15 months. Um, we we spent 12 of those months doing the big, big lap of Australia. So we went to pretty much everywhere. Um, took our, uh, our camper van around the country and uh, then we did a, a world cruise at the end of it just for something a bit uh, a bit more upmarket. Um, but that, that was a main driver for us. I, I, we could have done another year or two and you know bought another property, but we, we just figured you, you want to do this stuff when you're young. And um, yeah. back in those days, we didn't have kids, so uh, that made life a lot easier. Yeah, uh, no, I, I just, just so that people understand, I died in... And having had the pleasure of uh, reading your books, which I uh, recommend to others, uh, I remember you saying that you'd sort of supplemented the income just by doing some contract work. And it looks like you did a bit of contract work in Darwin and Timor with Deloitte. Exactly, yeah. 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 And uh, and that's where the world has become. For people who want to uh, seize control and live with intent, which I know is a big, uh, you know, big uh, one of your philosophies. I mean, the world has got so much... Um, more open to that. I, I can remember quite clearly at school um, the careers officer saying, "Well, if an employer spots a gap in your CV, you know you'll, you'll never be employed again." Sort of thing. And the world is nothing like that today. Um, you can do contracting, consulting, part-time work. Uh, you can generate income from online businesses. Um, you don't have to do the nine to five, you know, all the way through until the retirement date. There are many different ways and. In the absolute worst case, um, a lot of careers you can go back to. So, um, yeah, yeah that, that was a big part of our thinking. We we did some work in Darwin, um, and uh, funnily enough, we even did a, a, a bit of a stint back at Deloitte over the financial year end. Um, so, um, yeah, it's um, you know going back to accounting is not something that really grabs me, but the, the options always there. I'm sort of chartered accountant, so yeah, yeah, just um, having those options always handy. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the uh, you've you've done the round the world trip, uh, and you, know, I, you probably get asked this question all the time because I get it quite a bit as well. As well, you know, you you're kicking back. You can do what you like. You don't need to work. Why why go and open a business? Yeah, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's a very good question because to me, um, to financial independence. Uh, this is the way I looked at it. I, I figured if you've got a net worth of around about, say, $3 million, um, invested at a comfortable 5% return, well, that's that's enough passive income, 150K, especially in yeah. Australia with the freaking credits. In fact, it's more than enough yeah. um, just to kick back and do do nothing. But, um, yeah, I, you see, I, I'd taken 15 months 
um, to to uh, to travel there. I'm, I'm just not the sort of person that sits still very easily. Uh, I mean, literally so. Uh, and I sit here um, tapping my foot even uh, even while talking on the podcast and uh, drinking too much caffeine. But um, yeah, for me, I just wanted to you know to see how far I could take things. I I, I would find it very hard to envisage a circumstance where I didn't work. In fact, even when we travelled, I was always off heading to the library to read financial books. In fact, I actually wrote my first book while I was travelling. Um, you know, my wife was quite happy just pottering around and seeing the sights, but I you know, I always feel like I want to be doing. Um, so, so for me, that's why. Um, plus, we've now got a couple of kids, so I suppose leaving a legacy is something now that's more of a driver. But um, initially, I, yeah, just a, a drive for action, I suppose. Yeah, I... I, I... I uh, had a really good chat to Matthew McCallowitz on one of the earlier podcasts, and he's he's retired three times, uh, Pete, and uh, each time he says six months in, he's so bored and depressed. Uh, he it lacks a purpose, basically, that he's gone, bugger this, I, I'm going to get out there and have another crack. And he just, uh, he, he loves the thrill of the of the, the chase and the businesses that he's He's built um, I particularly, I think, for, for blokes. I think it's in our DNA. I, I don't think we're well designed uh, to be put out to pasture and go to the beach every day. It's great for a week <laughs> or even a month, but it's not It's not something that comes easily to most of us, uh, no. maybe some people. And uh, I've read a lot of these uh, financial independence, retire early type blogs. And I think they're, they're great and they certainly they didn't exist when we were younger and I think they're a great thing that people should aspire to but I, when people say well that's it you know I've retired on um, living on lentils for 25 grand a year or 40 grand or whatever I always think well that'll be great for the first year but then you'll be back you know because that's that's just the way we are. Yeah totally agree absolutely totally agree mate uh, so I uh, something that I'm also interested in just sort of digging into a little bit, uh, now I guess I'm, I'm mirroring my own experience, but uh, I, I know that uh, I wouldn't be enjoying the lifestyle we do if it wasn't for uh, the support of my partner. And I, I, I often say that the world focuses on individual fame, but normally it's a team that actually produces the results and... Uh, my wife Sonia and I—it's a real yin and yang that produces a one plus one equals three routine. Uh, the little bit you've said already about your good wife suggests that uh, she influenced your thinking. How how important has that partnership been to uh, the life you're now enjoying? Oh, hundred percent. I, I think um, it um, it opened up a whole new um, angle for me. The the idea of, of real estate. She she came from a, a farming background, very different to me because I was a city city born and bred person um, but her her parents um, were from a generation where well you didn't you didn't spend more than you earn and when you had excess you just reinvested it back into to land you know and that's um, you know all the way through their lives so they never never trusted the stock market they just bought more land and um, yeah you can't argue with the results um, <clears throat> and in fact uh, UK farmland has got the uh, prices have gone into uh, quasi bubble, I suppose, because um, it's inheritance tax free. So there's an awful lot of people. The um, the James Dysons of the world have been mopping up um, farmland, ostensibly because they're interested in farming, but actually because it's treated uh, favourably for tax. So uh, yeah, I mean the, the land has been a great investment for them over decades, and it, that that was really. Um, I mean, it's been a strong influence on me, uh, particularly as well, I think, because, I mean, Heather, my wife, was she was a better investor than me in the stock market too because um, I think it's well known that blokes are um, far too inclined to buy and sell too often, uh, whereas her view is always, um, well, <laughs> you know, the stock market crashed 2008-9 and you just, you just buy some shares when they're cheap and stick them in the bottom drawer, whereas I am you know, much more inclined to be looking all the time um, you know, is it up? Is it down? Should we you know, gear some, sell some? Uh, but her her philosophy has always been: you you never sell, you never sell property. And um, much as it, um, you know, I'm regularly saying, well, let's offload a couple and reinvest somewhere else. But she's absolutely adamant that her parents taught her you don't sell property. So that's uh, that's been our strategy for. Um, well, for, well, since she bought her very first house way back in in the mid '90s. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, proofs in the pie there, uh, and I guess I'm a, a massive advocate of the, 
the same thing. It's uh, you know, let time, leverage, and compounding returns do its work, and just get out of the way. Because as soon as you start stuffing around with it, that, that's when you make short-term mistakes with long-term consequences. But uh, it's uh, uh, I, I guess the difficulty we have these days, Pete, is that we live in such an instant iPhone everything world. And while we go into things investing for fifteen, twenty years. Uh, there's so much news smacking us the face every day that we're tempted to make short-term knee-jack uh, decisions. What's your advice to people to, uh, to to stay the course and ignore the noise? Yeah, well, certainly my, my philosophy has changed a lot. So these days, um, you know, uh, we recently inherited some money. I, I take the view that I, I buy things, uh, it doesn't matter if it's shares or property, that I... I know if I if I live till I'm 120, I know they'll still be performing. Um, so, in real estate, we've always tried to focus as much as the budget allows on quality, not quantity. And in the stock market these days, I tend to put money into listed investment companies. In Britain, we still invest in the FTSE 100, which um, you know it might not have been the uh, smartest choice, but we did. You know, you do what you know at the time, and. Um, We've got a FTSE um, index fund that we've been putting money into monthly for well for decades now, and it, it's, it just keeps doing what it what it does. Um, the FTSE is not going bust, just in the same way that Australian business isn't isn't going bust. Um, so so that's really what I do. And in terms of focus, uh, uh, drowning out the short term noise, because um, you, as you already mentioned. Uh, clickbait sells news. It's, it's almost pointless reading it, to be honest. Yeah. I think you want to have an awareness to some extent, you know. And, but I think with with real estate, there are there are a number of core rules that you know. If you if you buy off the plan high rise apartments, well, you could easily come unstuck because there's there's no scarcity. There's loads of unknowns. Uh, so I generally, I personally, I wouldn't buy off the plan. Um, the, you want to buy established property. You never get involved in a bidding frenzy because they never last, even though they feel like they will. So don't get involved in a fear of missing out. And just buy, I'd say 95% of it is common sense. You know, just buy properties that people actually want to live in and not stuff that is marketed as an investment opportunity. I think if you stick to those principles and then just forget about them, uh, forget about those assets, they'll do just fine. Yeah, 100%. I, I, something I'm keen just to drill into as well, you sort of mentioned the index funds and I uh, d- sort of talk at length in my, my own book about uh, you know going, from, going for growth with property and then converting to cash flow through index funds because uh, you know, I d- did a lot of reading around the subjects when I was looking at that years ago and uh, the, the stock pickers who had backing individual stocks, I think it's in the States it's about 0.1% of them that outperform the, the index. I think it's a little bit better here but not a, a great deal. Talk to us a little bit about um, uh, your thinking around that because if you're effectively buying the whole market and as long as your faith is in the long term upward growth of the market then that seems like a really low stress uh, lower cost ultimately because you're not churning and, and uh, better way to go. What Can you sort of add your thoughts to that, mate? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll put in a massive disclaimer up front. So no, no specific financial advice here, uh, but this way I can give some genuinely useful information. Uh, <laughs> so, look, everybody's circumstances are different. But um, as you said, so the index in Australia, so if you're talking about the ASX 200, there's, there's a lot of talk about Australia's stocks being a poor performer because the peak of the financial crisis, the index uh, shot up towards 7,000, then it crashed. A lot of the mining companies were never heard of again. And people, um, they benchmark against this irrational peak. But the, the thing that that overlooks is, well, one, it was an irrational peak, but two, uh, most of your returns in the stock market come from income. That's the thing. So if you, if you actually took a different view and said, well, let's say over 25 years, we're going to benchmark Australian stock market against um, the returns from the S&P 500 in the States, let's say that. So yeah. uh, $1,000 today. Now, obviously, this, this number changes by the day, but let's say it'd be worth about $9,000 today if you invested it in the US stock market, and it'd be worth almost exactly the same in Australian uh, shares as well. Now, the thing is, in Australia, we because of the tax system here, um, 
our dividend payout, uh, our dividend yields uh, through the cycles, that's the income that the companies pay you, that will average about 4% through the cycle. Yep. Whereas globally, most companies, well, if you look at the Apples and the Amazons of the world, they tend to be focused on growth. So they reinvest uh, their profits. So globally, uh, stock payout ratios, so dividend yields might be about, say, 2% through the cycle. So you've got to look at the total return from stock markets. And in Australia, yeah. a lot of our return comes from the dividend, which is great for people coming towards retirement yeah. uh, because they get a nice high dividend and um, they're treated quite favorably for tax in this country. Um, so to go back to your question, index funds. Uh, so um, now there's no specific recommendations here, but just to give you an, an idea, the, one of the most popular in Australia is the Vanguard, Vanguard. Aussie shares. Yeah, so it's, it's low risk, it's low cost, so they don't charge you lots of money. Uh, they're not trying to outperform, they're literally just holding the top few hundred companies in Australia. And um, if you looked over five years, uh, they've returned, uh, depends on the day that this podcast is going out, but uh, <laughs> roughly speaking, 9%. And about half of that comes from the income and half from the growth. Now, it yeah. always depends when you pick your start date and your finish date and so on. Um, now, if I was playing devil's advocate, um, now, I'm not in the city today, I'm in Noosa, but if, if I looked out the office window in Australia, I would see uh, CBA and NAB and ANZ and Macquarie and AMP. And, uh, I mean, straight away, you can see that Australia is quite top heavy in banks and financials. Um, so that's one of the things which has been a plus historically. Uh, for Australia's shares, um, we've run an oligopoly with those four big banks that uh, I'm sure we'll talk about at some point. <laughs> we will. <Royal> Commission. <laughs> um, and they've been very, very, um, they've generated strong return on equity in the mid-teens for, for a very long period of time, which may not continue. So I I personally don't, don't buy Vanguard shares for that, mainly just for that reason. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Vanguard is it, it's not discriminatory. It just buys all you know, the top hundred, few hundred companies, and uh, that means you, you do have a lot of unprofitable companies in there that don't pay frank dividends. So it's slightly less efficient than you might want. Yeah. Um, but Australia, and again, no specific advice here, but we do have some very established um, listed investment companies that do a very similar job. So the, the most popular ones or the most well-known uh, would be companies like uh, AFIC, and Argo and Milton, so they've been around since, um, well, 1928 to 1946, those companies. So they've been around for decades. Um, they've got a proven investment philosophy. Um, there's always some risk in investing, of course, uh, but they, they, they're low fee. Uh, they generally target profitable companies, and they're just a little bit less weighted in some cases um, to those uh, few banks. So there's a few reasons why I prefer that type of investment just to own in the index. Um, but just look at the returns over the decades. The dividends just keep on coming. Yeah, absolutely. Well, mate, uh, sort of bringing this into a uh, uh, your investment strategy and then what that does to your overall portfolio, are you happy just to share generically uh, what your uh, strategy is over time and and what your current investment portfolio looks like as a consequence and, and what it might look like down the track. Yeah, so I think one, one of the challenges for anyone who gets into real estate is that your portfolio suddenly can begin to look quite top-heavy and that's because, because you borrow money to invest in property. Uh, you're generally talking about buying much higher value assets. Um, so even though you might aspire towards the balanced uh, portfolio, uh, the extra leverage you use in real estate can mean that you're sort of tilted very heavily in that direction. And that's certainly been my experience. Um, you know, and not least because if you look at what's happened to price the price of real estate in London and Sydney and those kind of places, well, the value of my real estate you know, massively outweighs my stock market portfolio. Uh, not entirely through design, that's just the way the numbers have gone. Um, so I think over uh, that's where I am today. I think if you came back and did this podcast in 20 years, I would like to be uh, having shifted more towards the stock market and, and less of a 
a tilt towards real estate, but it, uh, that's the experience of a lot of people who get into property because of the borrowed funds. Yeah. Um, you can end up quite top heavy. Uh, yeah. But in terms of my um, property portfolio, it's pretty pretty evenly split between Australia and, and Britain. Um, but uh, the rules have changed over the years. So our gearing now in the UK is pretty close to zero, fully offset. Um, and uh, our gearing in Australia, mainly because of changes in price, our gearing ratio has just come down and down over the years. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess it's a, you're sort of going on that uh, growth to cash flow transition to some degree anyway with uh, where you're heading by the sounds of things. So uh, it would make sense ultimately to be shifting more strongly into the, uh, the equities side of the equation for that reason. But uh, yeah, mate, so just for those listeners who are, you know, early in their own journey and you've, you've sort of seen the, what, what I love about your experience is it's, it's not just Australian, it's, it's, you know, you're looking at the UK and as a consequence of that, you'd be sort of looking at global influences on things generally. Uh, what was, in terms of achieving sustainable success and, and moving towards financial freedom, what are the... What are the key learnings you've taken away from your journey that you would uh, uh, advise those starting out or, or you know, early on in their exercise to, to do? What, what should they be? Uh, uh, well, I think, um, yeah, as you take away probably from, from my journey, is uh, certainly start today. Um, you know, I think perfection, if you wait for the, the perfect time to invest, I mean, that's, that's merely a, that's a fantasy that you view in hindsight. You know, everyone is an expert reading the chart from from right to left but the best thing you can do is start start today learn from your mistakes but try to focus on quality investments that you can hold for the long term and one of the things we probably haven't touched on um is that uh, as charlie munger said the the wealthiest people generally do three things differently Uh, one is they don't bet very often um but when a good opportunity comes along they bet big And the third thing they do is invest for the long term. So they just don't pay anywhere near as much tax as somebody who buys and sells all the time. Um, Now, you know, everybody's got a product to sell these days, particularly in the stock market, but but actually in probably every asset class. And people will always encourage trading and buying and selling. But certainly my experience has been, um, you know, if you're in real estate, just a buy, renovate and hold strategy, if well executed, that can be tremendously effective over 20 years. Um, and in the stock market, it depends on your tolerance. It's, it's harder for people to watch the downturns if, they, if they're taking a buy and hold approach uh, because you get a daily quoted price. Um, but if you're a regular buyer, then the ups and downs tend to smooth themselves out. It's known as an averaging effect. Um, and you might just tweak that buy and hold strategy by uh, keeping a bit of dry powder, and when the market does get very cheap, um, there's a few indicators you can look at. You might just look to buy some more. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's. I think people overcomplicate this stuff. I think it's just take action and buy quality, and just keep on going. Yeah, it sums up perfectly, mate. And the, the 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 key there is is taking action, as you say. I mean, the the, the perfect opportunity is never going to arise, and if you wait for it, you'll be dead waiting. And uh, get eighty percent of it right, and then let time the tenant, the tax man, and uh, compounding uh, returns do the rest of the work while you get on with enjoying life. It, it isn't isn't really rocket science, is it, Pete? No, I mean it's um, so some of the things I uh, see in my in my coaching uh, programs is that you do find that I mean everybody's circumstance is different, and some people have phenomenally complex um, you know, complex personal positions today that need unpicking and you know, people have different structures and um, almost everybody's got a horror story about something they did uh, wrong along the journey and uh, <laughs> no, so it's, it's different for everybody but um, yeah I mean the, the fundamental uh, principles of success haven't changed a lot the specifics change a bit over time but um, yeah as you say a lot, a lot of it is very simple. Mm, well mate uh, let's start sort of moving to the future for a moment and I'll, I'll start with you know sort of personal uh, view and then I'll, I'll sort of go into some of the headwinds that might be uh, coming to us and your thoughts on what they are and what we should be doing about it but I always like to ask people mate because uh, it's a question that uh, a lot of Aussies don't spend a lot of time thinking about and that is 
what is your dream lifestyle? And you're probably living it now from what I'm hearing, but talk to us, put some colour and shape around your perfect day, your perfect week, your perfect year. And then is it any different from what you're currently doing and uh, what are you investing in uh, on top of what you're already doing to bridge the gap if there is one? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question. I, you, you may well have heard in the background, hopefully not, but uh, I've got kids that are two and four, so that's that's really my that's my main focus um, at the moment. Um, we we lived um, we did a long time, a dozen years or so in Sydney. We 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 had a few years, four years in Brisbane um, in New Farm, which we love. But we've um, I guess where the, where we were always heading to is a slightly more regional. Um, sort of lifestyle, and we're, we're now doing that. So we're living at, at Noosa, nice. um, and we we split our time between here, uh, which is great for the beach and having a pool and so on, uh, and and England. So we still have family in the UK. Um, so that's I mean that's a, that's what we designed and that's what we wanted to do. Um, in terms of how it will change, I guess it it changes a bit when the kids get towards high school because I don't I don't want my kids to have necessarily the same disruptions that I did growing up but um, yeah for the time being we're quite happy having that that flexibility and so from a business point of view I've always um, tried to um, I was a big advocate of reading Nassim Taleb and you know the unknown black swan events and so on so I've always tried to keep a very flexible approach to business so um, you know if we need to be away for a period of time we can do that um, so I, I guess to some extent more of the same. Um, love living on the Sunshine Coast. I think it's just uh, it's uh, the to me it's the best part of Australia. But don't forget, you know, I came from a cold climate, so I, <laughs> I'm coming to get away from that. Um, but yeah, I just I love the lifestyle up here, and um, yeah, that's to me this is where I, I would like to retire to. Yeah, yeah, no, awesome, mate. And I, 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 reason I focus on that is that, uh, again, I, that's the first question I ask everyone who comes to see me. What's what's your dream lifestyle look like? And quite often I get crickets, Pete, because it's like, oh, I've never actually thought about that. And I said, well, that's the only reason we're doing this is to get to that. So put some shape around it, and then how much is enough? Once we've generated enough income that's going to give you that lifestyle, that's game over. That's you, you don't need to do any more. You can then then choose what you want to do with when and who with. So, yeah, and I think, um, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier in the podcast, uh, I, I do uh, market analysis is probably 20% of what I do for institutional clients, but I'd say probably the other 80% is working with people on exactly that question. It's like, well, this is where you're at today. Um, so we can build a kind of a mothership and just say, right, this is, this is, these are your assets, your liabilities, your, your job and your income and expenses. And so where do you actually want to get to? Uh, because that really dictates on, you know, what you should be doing um, next. So, and I, I suppose, um, you know, having, having been through that process dozens of times with, with clients over the years, then um, you start to recognise a lot of the same patterns. But um, until you've answered that question where you want to get to, then, yeah, what you do next, you can't really know. Yeah, spot on, mate, spot on. Mate, let, let's talk to, uh, you know, and we've touched on this a couple of times already, but the, the mainstream media loves to keep us scared and there the, the, isn't a day that goes past without some sort of extra gloom and doom being thrown in the mix. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't know about you, but I've, I, I keep getting calls from clients that are on a 15-year strategy, but they're going, oh, I'm, I'm nervous, bushy, uh, should, I be, should I be selling this or selling that? Uh, and I'm just interested in you putting some colour around your thoughts on uh, you know, the, uh, this, this bubble talk and all the rest of it that keeps surfacing and, and massive uh, uh, drops in the real estate market. Give us your thoughts on, uh, if, if you're a, a long-term investor, uh, what the reality is and what, if anything, they should be doing. Yeah, well, I guess it comes back to the old, uh, was it Mike, Mike Tyson quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I think um, the, the thing is with every asset class, you get summer seasons, which we've had particularly in Sydney and Melbourne real estate for about five or six years. Um, and then you get a winter season and they, there is, there's nothing uh, that's going to change there. And it's the same with governments. You know, people talking about the Labor government. Well, 
yeah, that, that's what follows a coalition government. That's not going to change. Uh, the, the, a lot of these things, um, they will continue to come and go. So the thing that needs to change is you. Um, the, the seasons will continue to come and go. I, I think in terms of real estate, well, look, if you've got an absolute dog of an asset that you should never been never have been owning in the first place well that that's that's one thing so if you've got a if you've got a property that's um, you're paying through the nose for to hold and it you've got problems and headaches it's not going to uh, generate the returns you want well yeah you might you might be looking to uh, to offload it but if, if your strategy was to buy quality assets and, and hold on to them well there hasn't been a whole lot Really, when you actually look at the numbers for established properties in Sydney, there hasn't been a whole lot there to scare you. Um, but there are certain regions, if you bought, uh, and uh, to be honest, if you listen back to the Business Insider podcast in 2017, February 2017, and you know a lot of this stuff was predictable. Yeah. There are people paying a million million dollars for a house in Mount Druitt. Well, <laughs> you know those those houses weren't going higher. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of it just comes back to common sense, but the, the media stuff. I mean, we we say that me, you know media has to write clickbait um, to to sell papers. I mean, it, it's it's actually literally true now. I mean, we know that real estate is always on the top most read articles of the day, uh, so we know there'll be daily news. And in fact, there are even outlets now that their whole raison d'etre is to sell gloom. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, if if uh, if it's something that worries you, reading that stuff is not going to help. Um, certainly, I've got better things to be doing with my time. Yeah. I think it, you know, portfolio sense check. Um, you know, somebody who owns uh, Sydney properties myself. You know, I, I did a bit of a review, um, and different sectors of the market have been impacted more than others. But really, when you look at it, um, you know, apartments in the eastern suburbs might be off a few percent, five percent, maybe. I suppose um, after rising a hundred percent. I mean, it's all. It's a lot of it is noise, depending on the asset you hold yeah um but you've really got to come back to what what was your plan in the first place yeah well I, I, i've been saying for a while that uh, you know the the correction in sydney and then sort of flowing on uh, to melbourne is just a normal part of the cycle you know 10 to 15 percent uh, uh softening there is perfectly normal from from where i sit given i've been playing the space for nearly four decades and it's uh, i'm not not even raising a sweat around it, yet people are sort of talking about the sky falling in and, uh, uh, and whatnot. So, but, but I guess the, there are uh, uh, some of the things that I, I do think are influencing, and I've, I've always said that property is a game of finance because it's the finance that fuels the ability to actually uh, you know, purchase the asset. And there's, there's certainly no doubt with the progressive series of reviews of uh, lending and the banks and uh, whatnot, it's certainly been a very significant tightening uh what's your feelings on on that as to where it's at and what that might be doing to uh, uh property in the short to medium term yeah well I, I think it's um a lot of other countries that that um that change in appetite came 10 years ago it's taken longer for australia to get to that point um but yeah i mean much as a lot of real estate people don't want to hear it the, the reality is that something did have to change because uh, the rules that were in place or, should, or weren't in place more accurately um, when we had mortgage rates at 7, 8, 9%, um, they weren't really adequate when you could borrow money at 3.5% and everybody was piling in and uh, you know the, no, the Royal Commission would no doubt have uncovered it didn't follow it too closely but instances of people buying properties and revaluing them the next day and leveraging against those and yeah, so there's a number of things that have changed. Um, so I, if you want to get technical, which I guess most listeners don't, but um, APRA introduced a, a practice guide, APG 223, and um, the guy you know well, Rolf Latham, um, talked about that as a chemical change, which I thought was an excellent mm. uh, description. It's, it's a chemical change in the way that mortgage lending will take place from now on. It won't be reversed. So we won't go back to the days of people... Um, buying 60 properties in 60 months and things like that because it's, um, it will be much more dictated around people's incomes and their ability to service debt, which in the long run is not a bad thing. Um, but um, in terms of generic uh, real estate price growth, it will be lower than a period where we've seen interest rates fall from 15% to not, not very much. You know, the key word there is generic. And I'd, I'd like... 
I think we're both of the same view that uh, you're not buying the market, you're buying a property. And uh, if you've bought quality property in the right area that's got a strong and growing income demographic that's going to continue to uh, support property growth in an area of scarcity where everyone wants to live, then uh, property is still going to be a great place to stick your money. What's your thoughts? Yeah, on that? and, and some, some things are, are different in Australia and some aren't. But, um, yeah, as you said, areas of scarcity. But not, not everybody is a first home buyer. A lot of people have business and equity, um, income or, or wealth. And the other thing that Australia doesn't have is the death duties. So in Britain, we've got astronomical uh, inheritance taxes, like 40%. So everybody, every time somebody passes, um, the executor has, has to pass on this enormous liability and and portfolios get sold down. But Australia doesn't have that. You know, we've just got, um, you know, wealth accruing, rightly or wrongly, into certain pockets. Um, and if you've bought property in areas of scarcity, um, I mean, just look at the projections for Sydney and Melbourne going to populations of 8 million. Um, I mean, land is a scarce commodity in those cities. Um, so, yes, generic price growth in first home buyer housing estates and so on, well, that, that, will, be, that will be tied to income growth, uh, which is hard to predict but currently low. Um, but, yeah, other areas will do fine. And you don't buy the housing market as much as the media will try to... <laughs> reinforce that point. You're only really by a very small cross section of it. Yeah, mate, I, I, my feeling, to be honest, is that uh, while there's no question, uh, credit's never been cheaper to get, but it's never been harder to get either in, in this country. And uh, I, I wonder whether the, the pendulum swung a little bit too far because there was layer upon layer upon layer of risk protection now built, built into that process. And the most recent... Uh, uh, focus on an almost forensic focus on living expenses is significantly dropping borrowing capacities by between 20 to 40 percent and what we've seen which has a almost a direct flow on in terms of uh, you know what people are able to buy and therefore does have a softening effect but wage growth i think therefore is going to underpin that so if we don't have the wage growth uh, that allow people to be able to borrow the money they need to get into the property, then that would tend to uh, plateau uh, in some areas. What's, what's your thoughts around wage growth and uh, is that under threat given uh, you know it's been pretty flat for a while? What's, what's your feelings around that subject? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's flat, but it's not, it's not just an Australian problem. Uh, wages, I guess, including bonuses, are doing about 2.7%. So they're growing and ahead of inflation, certainly ahead of core inflation. But it's, it's been a weak period. I mean, Australia, that was probably inevitable anyway, because we went through a period through the mining boom where real wages were absolutely flying. Yeah. Um, so you, know, you can't see wages um, just soaring ahead of the rest of the world. You know, that wasn't going to continue. But even globally, there's, there's a big change that technology has changed a lot. Um, the global supply of labour, if you want to get technical, um, across Asia and other parts of the world has increased massively. So a lot more stuff gets outsourced. Um, we have a lot more part-time work and contract contracting work, as we already discussed. So there are a few factors that are, are, are putting downward pressure on on wages growth. But mm. the thing is, um, I guess, um, monetary policy, everyone's talk, talks about low interest rates, but low in what sense? You know, they're yeah. not low enough to, uh, to bring unemployment down to where it should be and not low enough to uh, put um, to put pressure on the labour market. So it's in, <laughs> in another sense, it's been behind the curve for a long time. Um, now, unemployment now is down to 5%, but there's still a lot of underemployment away from Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. Um, so like, we, haven't, we haven't completely reinvented the business cycle and um, if, if the um, you know, if governments and the Reserve Bank can get unemployment down to 4% and get un underemployment down, then wages growth will come back. But um, uh, for the time being, it's, it's going to be a gradual recovery, I guess. Um, yeah. Interestingly, in Britain, um, with, with the um, developments over there, see a lot of Eastern European workers have, um, have returned home. The Pol Polish economy is booming. And other parts of Europe are doing well, and actually wages have taken off in Britain. So it, it just shows that the laws of supply and demand haven't gone away. It's just um, 
yeah, at the moment, Australia has high immigration and, and much as real estate people, uh, you know, try to downplay the impact, that does have an impact on wages. Um, it's a yeah. suppressor. Um, and, um, yeah, we haven't had a, an economy that's really been firing for a long period of time. So, uh, but um, th- these things go in cycles and wages growth can come back. Yeah, okay. No, well, let, let's switch to something that is very topical and it'll, it'll uh, we're having a discussion in early Feb and it'll be a few weeks before uh, this goes live, but the the Royal Commission on Banking's final report was released last week, uh, as we all know, Pete, and uh, I guess there's a lot of us a, a little bit in shock and surprise at uh, the outcome and, uh, you know, I've, I've started calling it the Royal Commission on Brokers because they seem to be the... Uh, the scapegoat that the donkeys pin the tail on. Uh, what's what's your view of that uh, and likely impact on uh, the average person if all of those recommendations end up being implemented? Yeah, so I think my my take on it, I didn't watch all of it. I've got better things to be doing with my time. <laughs> uh, I think uh, there, there was good. There was really there's three things I'd take away. There was. Um, the, the, the terms of the Royal Commission, when, when you looked at the initial terms, I thought this is going to be hell on earth for, for the banks and financial services because the terms essentially said, um, show us your worst, and if you don't, um, you'll, be, uh, you'll be heading off to prison. That, that, that kind of approach, which mm. basically banks and financial services providers had to, had to reveal everything. And, of course, in an industry as large... Um, as, as big a sector as financial services is, there, there's always going to be some skeletons. And, um, of course, those did come out. Um, great headlines. Um, the risk was always that those um, those events were extrapolated across the entire sector. Um, so I think the good thing that came out from the final report was that, um, it, I mean, the, the Commission actually did acknowledge that household expenses are being better monitored from a mortgage point of view now. And in fact, lending standards were almost given a, a green tick. To mm. some extent, they said, well, they, you know, yes, they, we've had some, we, we wrote too many interest-only loans and there were too many investor loans. And of course, we all know that the industry had some some dodgy loans written. That's just a fact. But um, yeah, the, I think the, the report took quite a commercial approach in one sense, and that it, it didn't introduce further rules and regulations to tighten down on credit further. So that was the positive. Yeah. Uh, the negative, as you've already mentioned, um, the recommendations on mortgage brokers. I think, I think when people actually sit down and think these things through, they won't be implemented in full because with a real world hat on, um, they just load more and more power back into the four uh, major banks, which is surely wasn't the point of the Royal Commission. Um, and even just think about simple real world scenarios. So you, you take out a, a five hundred grand loan with the bank and it, they charge you five thousand dollars for the for the privilege. Um, but then what happens the, the next day the bank jacks up the, the rates because of funding cost pressures or whatever else. Um, and then you charge another five thousand dollars to refinance out. It just it doesn't make any sense when you think it through. Um, now uh, I think the coalition has seen this straight away. Uh, the, the only challenge might be is that Labour, in their infinite wisdom, said they would accept all recommendations before they'd even seen them, um, which I, I think ostensibly was to, to to be seen to be tough, you know, tough on the banks. But, um, of course, they weren't expecting that recommendation. Um, so whether or not they see the light, um, we'll have to wait and see. But I, I think it'll be a hard thing for them to implement and certainly to get through the Senate. I, I just don't, I don't think... That what's been recommended will end up coming to pass. That's my hope, anyway. Mm, it's similar because uh, you remove the competitive element from the exercise, and it's it's really interesting, mate. We've seen uh, done some research on this, and if you look at the sort of margins that banks were getting pre the the introduction of brokers to what it is today, uh, the uh, competitive element that's been brought in uh, has has dropped that by about forty percent. And uh, about 60% of loans are now written through uh, mortgage brokers who you know, can offer you know, between 35 and 40 different uh, lending options and uh, over 2,000 different uh, loan solutions versus you know, traditionally the banks and I think the Commonwealth Bank still 
even despite that, writes over 50% of the, or close to 50% of the loans in the country, or has them uh, from historic plus, plus new business. So uh, I think it would be a very retrograde step to uh, uh, almost penalise the, the broking channel that plays squarely back into the hands of the big banks and uh, the, the smaller banks who are very reliant on uh, brokers to introduce new business to them are also going to suffer. So it's, it's going to have a massive impact on competition. As we all know, if you reduce competition, then the ones that are left uh, jack up the prices and the, it's the end consumer at the day that... That pays, so uh, it's going to be very interesting, and I, I think the yeah. And let's be honest, royal commissions—they're run by, uh, to be blunt, lawyers and jobs worth. So they've got a vested interest in um, you know, making these things drag on with multiple recommendations, but you know, but with no real-world experience of what they're actually recommending on, which is uh, why you end up. Uh, most of the royal commission, I have to say, the recommendations seem very sound to me, but that one. Mm stood out like a sore thumb. Is that well, okay, now now let's get back to the real world. Um, now, of course, you know, the, the major banks had to do what they did, and um, Matt Common of CBA produced some very flaky figures to show uh, that mortgage brokers were earning hundreds of thousands per annum. I thought, you know, he pulled, pulled, the, pulled the numbers out of his butt, I think. Um, <laughs> but but they, had to, they had to do that because the major banks have been losing market share. So that was, that was their um, yeah. game plan was to turn the blowtorch on mortgage brokers, which worked. But, um, yeah, I just think any any sensible policy uh, shouldn't follow the recommendation. That's my view. Yeah, and I 100% agree for the, the benefit of uh, all homeowners in, in that regard. And, I mean, I, it's interesting. The uh, done a bit of research on this as well. The, the average uh, mortgage broker, there's, there's 28,000 people employed directly full-time in, the, in that industry. And uh, if, if it is... If those recommendations are fully implemented, it will wipe that industry out. There's absolutely no question about it. But the average average broker only earns uh, gross before tax about 80, 80 to eighty six grand a year. So they're not exactly that's it. Gross. Uh, you know, you, you look at the net figures, um, and you know, uh, Matt Common was talking about you know millionaire mortgage brokers. It was complete bullshit, basically. But uh, I guess that was their their game plan, and. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it worked for the purposes of the commission, but hopefully it won't, uh, hopefully it won't be followed through. Yeah, no, totally great. No, awesome. Well, I, I, I'm certainly uh, encouraging people to make some noise about it because at the end of the day, it'll be the average homeowner that will pay the penalty if, if they are implemented. And given we're running into an election, now is the time to be making some noise and letting your local senator and your MP know about it. But there's also, given that election... Uh, uh, there's some other headwinds uh, coming that yourself and RiskWise Property Research have documented uh, in a, an awesome report around the potential impacts of negative gearing and the C, uh, capital gains tax changes that they're, they're talking about. would love you to expand on that a little bit so in, in, in a way that someone listening in uh, understands what it means and what the, the impacts are and aren't as, as you see it at this stage, mate, please. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, 99% of the time, I, I don't put my name to other people's research reports because what I do is independent analysis. But uh, RiskWise got me on board um, initially to, to show me their modelling. And it, it was when when I looked at their modelling, I thought, this is actually, this is really good stuff because they they got access to statistics that, that other research houses haven't, uh, mainly by Logic and others, um, and they actually did some really sophisticated modelling uh, all around the country. So they didn't just say right. Um, so there were previous reports done by, say, Grattan Institute that they said right, this is the value of negative gearing. Take that off, so prices fall one percent, which is okay. That's that's good if you've got a cigarette packet to put your results onto, but it's not. You know, it's not really going to help analyse what happens to, you know, to individuals. Parts of the housing market is a pretty diverse place, Australia. Um, so yeah, we worked through the numbers. Now I was really impressed with their modelling, and they they, they produced a, a long form report which went to the very top. So it went to to Treasury and it went to the Coalition, went to Labor. That they've all had a read, and uh, um, or at least they had a read of the summary. Um, and yeah, it, it generated a lot of interest. Um, now. I suppose um, that 
people always say, well, you're a real estate person. Of course, you're going to be against the changes. Like, it was a very balanced report. Mm. Uh, what it said was, well, look, there is an impact on price because um, for well, you, you reduce demand for housing and that's what's going to happen. So um, just to recap, so the Labour's proposal is that negative gearing uh, is grandfathered for people who are already invested. So a uh, bit of intergenerational theft for you. Um, those of us who <laughs> own uh, property portfolios can keep our tax benefits for as long as we like. Um, but new new investors can only get negative gearing on new dwellings. That was that's the idea. But of course, um, like a lot of these things, they sound good on paper, but then there's a whole lot of unintended consequences. Um, so the, the main challenge is that you, you try and funnel investors into buying new apartments. Uh, but then, of course, what happens is um, the, how should we say, the the lower end of that market, developer market um, buy, build stuff that's specifically targeted to investors. And we, we've seen a lot of this through the cycle already. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about sort of 50, 60 square metre apartments, high rise on main roads, you know, sort of stuff that nobody wants to live in, yeah. but they can sell through a brochure to an investor. Uh, before it was Chinese investors that, that were the target, but now it will be, uh, you know, negative gearing, uh, you know, get your benefits here sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but, but the trouble is twofold. One is that the asset is rubbish. And two is that when you come to sell that property, uh, the next buyer won't have access to the same tax benefits that you do. So you've yes. created a two-tier housing market. Yep. And, um, I mean, it's essentially funneling people into bad investments. People will lose money. Now, we, we've already got statistical proof to show that buying new apartments is riskier than buying established apartments um, for two reasons. One, when you buy off the plan, the product doesn't always uh, live up to the uh, the brochure. But secondly, <laughs> because you pay a premium to buy brand new property. So it's going to create a lot of losses for investors. Um, and it will be unwitting people that are, that are drawn into it. Um, but, um, yeah, there will also be an impact on the established housing market because investors uh, – where yields are three and a half percent, investors won't won't invest. So um, there'll be a rental shortage in some of the established housing markets, not all, um, and rents will go up. I mean, the one thing you can say with certainty is that rental yields will rise. Um, yeah. Now, wh whether that's because prices fall or rents go up, um, it depends on the sub region. It depends on the property type. Um, yeah. And uh, RiskWise did some really good modelling on prices. On rents, we found it harder because um, rents generally don't respond quite quite as quickly yeah. um, as prices do. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it was clear there'll, there'll be an impact on price. Labor says there won't be, but there will. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, there, there will also be an impact on um, new investors um, buying suboptimal assets, shall we say. Yeah. And um, yeah, there will, there will also be an impact on the rental market. Um, so the idea of funneling investors into new dwellings is that it will stimulate construction. Um, but actually, we've got more than 40 years of figures to show that when prices fall, uh, construction slows. It's just it's just the cycle. Yeah. Uh, and if you get, you might get a few developers uh, throwing up some speculative um, tower blocks, but it's not that's not a uh, that's not a solution to housing affordability. That's just we'll get some more shoeboxes. So. Um, yeah, look, overall, uh, it's not a great policy, but it was never about um, being a good policy. It was populist, and it was it was designed to win votes rather than actually improve the housing market. Well, the, the thing for me, mate, as I, as I see it, and I've had a really good read to that report, which it, it's a really good report, mate. I'm, I'm uh, fairly critical of a lot of the stuff that in the independence, but the independence that yourself and Doran bring to the table on the – the sophistication of the analysis is, you know, second to none. I, I commend you on it. But uh, you, you take away the, the guts of it and uh, we're likely to see, you know, varying by location, but between 6 to 10% uh, decreases in property values across across the board. And that's, there's this perception that it's only affecting investors. Well, no, it's, it's affecting everyone who owns property and that you'll get the flip side with the increased uh, rents potentially. Well, the 6 to 10%... Uh, impact across the board. Let's take eight percent as the average. That's going to wipe five hundred sixty billion off the value of housing across the country. And most Australians have got more than fifty percent of their wealth in their house. 
And from for me, looking looking at it, a, a vote for Labor at this election is a, a, it's going to cost me, uh, you know, if, on an average uh, four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollar property. That's there's a, a vote that's costing you forty to sixty grand. So uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And I guess the frustration for me, uh, Pete, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, is that uh, the Labor Party seems to have the head in the sand. There's been your report plus a bunch of other good quality independent uh, studies done that have all been presented to them and they're just sort of shaking it off and keep referring back to the Treasury study that was done back in 2016 when the market was in a completely different place. How how do we get the message through? Oh, look, uh, Labor won't be... They're not really, let's face it, it's, it's politics. They're interested in the polling, and the polling t- so far has, has remained favourable. Um, I think they, they give, if, if you see the interviews with um, Chris Bowen, now Chris Bowen is a very sharp operator and, uh, and short, and if you, if you see the interviews with them, they give non-answers to the, to the types of questions. You know, they, you know, short in terms about, talks about, oh, you know, that, House prices won't fall. That they will, they will, we will just turn down the simmering on the hob. You know, just bullshit answers like that. Which don't, you know, they're, they're not real, real answers. They're just cleverly worded spin. Um, so I think uh, Labor won't be that interested in um, in actually listening to advice on the on the point. They, they will be interested in, in polling, and at the moment that's favourable. Uh, I think, as you said, that. The policy was designed when it was written in 2016 to reduce the number of investors in the market and to level the playing field so more first home buyers can get in. Well, both of those things have already happened. Mm. And um, the coalition it didn't get much uh, fanfare, but they, they actually did reduce yep. the excesses in negative gearing. So they reduced depreciation, yeah. benefits, they, they removed travel expenses, uh, They the macro prudential measures have well, investor credit is the lowest it's ever been, the growth in investor credit. So all of the things that the policy was designed to do have already happened, but they're going to stick with it because uh, there's no way they'll reverse in the lead up to an election. Uh, I suppose one question mark is if you look at the composition of the Senate, um, some of the Senate is in favour of reform, um, plenty are against, I'm guessing they're they're property owners, uh, but there's the, the, the middle that could actually swing the vote are actually in favour of a cap. So what you might see is a watered-down version. So you might not see the capital gains tax get across the line, or you might see that the rules um, say, well, you can claim up to $10,000 of negative gearing, say, which to me is a far more sensible policy. If you, if you want to trim the excesses, um, you know, just cut down on the people that are doing it six or seven times over rather than you know, the, the average first home buyer who just wants to get on the market. Mm, yeah, no, it's a much more sensible approach. Awesome, mate. Well, look, uh, you've given us some uh, great juice on that. I, I'd like to uh, bring the discussion to a, a, uh, a head with what I call the ambush, uh, which is five quick questions, Pete, that uh, all the audience keeps asking me about and would, would love to get your thoughts on. So you've mentioned a couple yep. of juicy ones already. Uh, your favourite quote and why? Um, goodness me, a favourite quote. Um, <laughs> look, I suppose uh, one of the people is uh, popularity comes and goes um, over time. But I, I've been a big fan of Tony Robbins, certainly when I was younger, he was a big influence. And he, one of the things he talks about is this concept of Kaizen, you know, the constant and never-ending improvement. So I don't know if it's specifically a quote, but to me that is a, is a mantra or a philosophy to live by, um, you can't get better than that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a Japanese philosophy that's uh, really driven Toyota to its heights. It's uh, just in time. It's always improving. How can we do things better? And that's, yeah, uh, says a lot about that. Okay, yeah, let's flip to your top book that you would recommend and why, and, and I'll talk about the, the five you've already written, and the, they are must-reads for anyone who's interested in investing uh, in whatever it is, Pete, uh, having... Uh, uh, got all of them dog-eared on my shelf. Uh, but the, what would you recommend and why, mate? Um, well, I actually wrote down a, a pre-prepared answer to this question. I came up with about 12, so it wasn't much use to me. Uh, the, 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 the book I put at the very top of the list was Tony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within. Um, as a, as a, an overall uh, goal-setting 
um, and life strategy book. I mean, I must have read that book a thousand times over the years. I, I still go back and do the exercises, and that, that's pretty rare for me in books. I usually flick through them. Uh, so that, that would be a book that I just keep coming back to. Um, and then for, I suppose, if you're interested in the stock market, I'll just throw this one in there. Um, if you're interested in Australian stocks, try a book called Motivated Money by Peter Thornhill. Um, if you're a real estate person, it might scare you a bit because he challenges a few of your preconceptions. But um, if you're interested in how you can actually make money from the stock market without speculating, that is a, that is a real classic, been around 15 years or so. Uh, so try those. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, very good suggestions. Now, this question is something that uh, everyone talks about in Australia because there's this, this feeling that we all pay too much tax. Mind you, we live a fantastic lifestyle as a result of that. But uh, what's the top legal thing that you've done to pay less tax yourself, Pete? Uh, well, tax recommendations I give to other people is, well, make sure you're claiming your depreciation, all your deductions, and make sure your structure's right. But the, the number one best thing that you can do is be a long-term investor because the more you trade the more tax you pay so it comes back to that charlie munger piece that he wrote um and yeah the wealthy they don't bet very often but when they do they bet big and they invest for the long term and the 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 difference that one simple thing makes to your returns is astronomical yeah absolutely massive difference okay and the um uh, Looking at both ends of the extreme, what's both the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received, Pete? Uh, well, I guess, yeah, adv- advice, you know, people, if you take advice from people who haven't achieved results, it's nearly always bad advice. So so people, you know, when, when assets are cheap, people are always telling you don't buy. Uh, and that's, you know, that just comes around every cycle. So um, that's the worst, that's the worst piece of advice. I mean, in fact, a lot of advice is well-meaning. People telling you don't, don't invest. Um, but I look back through my journey, and so well, that's that's really led to everything that I do today has come from a decision to take action. So I guess that that's basically it. Um, I've had lots of bad specific advice, but uh, yeah, that that comes and goes. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it really it's, it's nearly always um, people without the results to show. Uh, giving you uh, well-meaning but ultimately bad advice. Yeah, I call it the, the the law of inverse investment, mate. The the louder the opinion, the less likely they are to have any. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Seems to be the way that goes. All right, mate. And the the best piece of advice? Um, yeah, I think um, yeah, I, I, I suppose I'll to defer to my wife really because she she's been adamant that we should build a property portfolio and never sell it and. Um, yeah, every year you, you look back at the you know the the results and certainly look back at the prices you paid, which seemed you know seemed astronomical at the time. I think her, her first house she paid uh, I don't know sixty sixty eight thousand pounds for you know and to that, today we've still got a mortgage on that. Um, <laughs> it's probably offset, but um, yeah, and you, you look at what people pay for a house in Cambridge these days. I guess a million bucks is kind of normal and. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's it. this the simple thing of just following long term compounding growth. Um, because our brains aren't designed to to understand numbers in that way. We're, we're very much designed to think um, think in today's numbers and think rationally. But compound growth just does something that our brains can't um, fully grasp. Yeah, so I think it was what Einstein termed the eighth wonder of the world, mate. So uh, uh, it's. And the longer you leave it, the the better it gets. So, no, that awesome. Now, just sort of to bring it to a close, then, Pete, if you spoke to a school leaver, or perhaps one of your kids when they they're about to embark on their journey in the world, what would you advise them to invest their time, their money, and their skills in to create their version of freedom? Well, so that's actually a timely question because I have to go and speak um, at, a, at the Somerset Festival in Queensland in uh, in March, and I'm speaking to kids across the age spectrums um i think in terms of investing well the you know low cost uh compounding growth those are those are really simple but important uh, concepts to understand but I, I would encourage people to love what they do as well i mean life life is ultimately pretty short and it's too definitely too short to waste it doing things you know doing it doing something for a crust that you don't really enjoy i think you know, there's always a, a, a time and a place for doing things because you have to 
and um, you know your first job flipping burgers or whatever it is. Uh, not for me, because I'm vegetarian. But um, <laughs> it, I think um, yeah, you know, there's there's a time and a place for for doing jobs and. You know, things that you don't necessarily want to do, but your long-term goal should be to do something you're passionate about because you'll do it better and you'll excel. Yeah, no, wise words, mate. Mate, uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, for those that want to reach out and uh, either read more or do more with you, what's the best way of doing that, mate? Yeah, check out. I've got a couple of websites. So um, main website's just my name, PeteWarjan.com, and that, that kind of filters through to all my books and blogs and so on. Um, my daily blog is PeteWarjan.blogspot, a um, couple of million hits on there these days. And um, if you're interested in my, my coaching website, I post quite a bit on there too, so that's um, GoNextLevelWealth.com.au. Fantastic, mate. Look, uh, very appreciative of your insights. I've, I've uh, respected your, your insights uh, for a long time, mate. Um, and we'll continue to be a very avid follower. follower. Very generous with your time today, and I look forward to having you back on. To, uh, uh, have a, further chats in the future, mate, if you're open to it. Pleasure. Thanks very much for having me on as well. Thanks, Pete. Well, Freedom Fighters, how good was that? To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H E W L O khgroup.com.au or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening and as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die tomorrow.